please visit sleephappia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy! Good afternoon, everybody. This is Justine Amder here at sleepapnea.org. Thank you for joining us on our weekly speaker series. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Richard Novak join us. He is the adjunct clinical professor of anesthesiology at Stanford University and also in clinical practice. And he is here today to talk to our community about having sleep apnea and preparing for an upcoming surgery, whether it's just a general surgery that you are having or something that is related to your sleep apnea. So I want to welcome Dr. Novak and thank him for his time in joining us today. There you are. Hello. Greetings. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to talk with you a little bit about um, an anesthesiologist's role in patient care in, in the uh, pre-op, which is before the surgery happens, uh, intra-op, which is while it's going on, and then post-op in, in recovery. Um, so let's go ahead and get started a little bit with what happens before a patient uh, is um, headed into the surgery uh, room. Um, why is it important for uh, patients to talk to all of their doctors involved about their pre-existing conditions and uh, sleep apnea and medicines and so forth that they're taking? The anesthesiologist is responsible for all the medical care before, during, and after the surgery. So it's important that we understand the past medical history of the patient. The past medical history comes from the chart, but much of it comes from the patient as a historian. So your listeners, because they're patients who have sleep apnea, if they understand their sleep apnea and they know their history, that helps the physicians a lot. The anesthesiologist will rely on notes from the primary care doctors and also from, from the surgeon. If there's any tests that were done, for example, if the patient's had a sleep study, that's very helpful. But mostly, the most important aspect of the anesthesiologist pre-op is to decide where to do the surgery. That is, can it be done in an outpatient surgery center? Does it need to be done in a hospital because the patient is too sick? Uh, what sort of anesthetic will be necessary, and to make sure they're well prepared for the right plan for that patient and that surgery. So when you're doing this intake with, uh, with patients, um, is it part of everyone's protocol to talk about uh, sleep apnea? Um, and are there times when maybe before you have your surgery, you get sent out for a sleep study? The way I would answer that question is this. Your patients may very well have had sleep studies. Most of the patients we anesthetize that have sleep apnea don't. There are many patients that we see that you can tell by looking at them based on their body habitus and how much they weigh that they're likely to have sleep apnea, but they don't have a test. The only definitive way is to have a test done. But it, according to the research that's available, the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is anywhere between 9 to 17 percent in the adult population. Those are the people that are documented diagnosed cases. In addition to that, there are many others that an anesthesiologist will look at someone who weighs, for example, 260 pounds or 5 foot 10 inch tall 60 year old man who has a thick neck and uh, gives a history of snoring we can assume that that's a clinical diagnosis of sleep, ap sleep apnea and have to take precautions based on that, even though there is no sleep study. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Would you, um, does someone that is working with the patient specifically for the surgery, be it yourself or other professionals, um, you know, provide that information that maybe as they continue on their recovery, that they should talk to their, their primary doctor or maybe seek a specialist to, to rule out sleep apnea as, you know, something that in addition that they might have? The way I would answer that, it's a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum is a patient coming into a hospital for a bigger surgery. So they're having a total knee replacement or they're having surgery on their airway for their sleep apnea. Those patients are likely to have a sleep study. They're likely to have a well-documented history in the chart. 
and everybody's well prepared to manage the sleep apnea around the time of surgery. The other end of the spectrum, which is more common, is a patient coming to an outpatient center for a smaller surgery. In addition to working at Stanford University Hospital, I also am the medical director at a freestanding surgery center in Palo Alto, California. We do about 100 cases a week of outpatient surgeries where the patients come in and they go home and they are on their own after two hours after they leave the surgery center. So they have to be taken care of carefully and safely so that when they go home, they don't stop breathing. The way we handle that sort of preoperative intake is we have an individual call the patient two days ahead of time and screen for medical problems. If they have the history of obstructive sleep apnea, that's noted on the patient's chart. If they don't, every patient is still asked the stop bang questionnaire, which I believe you're your readers or listeners are are aware of. But specifically, if the patient is a male over the age of 50, if they have hypertension, if they are tired during the day, if they snore, if they have been witnessed to stop breathing, if they have a, uh, a neck that's over 17 to 18 inches in circumference, those are the elements of the stop bang questionnaire. And if the patient has a score of five or greater, they're at risk for having sleep apnea. If they have three to five of those, they are in an intermediate risk for sleep apnea. So um, those, in every one of those patients that has sleep apnea, then I'm informed of those cases. And then based on the surgery they're going to have done and their other comorbidities, I make a decision whether it's safe for them to have the procedure at a freestanding center or not. Yeah. My... Um... Uh, last summer, my husband, who has severe sleep apnea, uh, had um, outpatient surgery, but they, they, it actually was at Stanford and it was at their surgery center, but they did keep him overnight. So he wasn't in a hospital room. He wasn't, you know, taking up a bed or anything, but they did have him there just because his, his apnea was so severe. They wanted to make sure that he was monitored at least for, you know, 24 hours to make sure everything was okay. Especially also since he was having surgery in his mouth, which would then, you know, cause swelling in the area, like you're saying, which part of the body is it happening on? And do you need to pay a little bit more closer attention to that. Yeah. That, that's an important distinction. Because he was having surgery on his airway, the surgeon and the anesthesiologist made the careful call to have him absorb, obs, observed overnight in the hospital setting versus a freestanding center where they would have to go home and be unobserved. Right, right. Yeah. I know that I, you know, as his spouse felt very good about, you know, having that extra time there with the professionals, you know, to make sure that everything was, you know, okay for, for him and, you know, gave me a, uh, um, a little bit of breathing room as well, just to, you know, relax, because that is also something, you know, any uh, surgery that's upcoming for a patient and their family is always, you know, riddled with a little bit of anxiety, you know, about about the situation. So that that was helpful. Um, it just a final question about talking a little bit about before the operation, um, you know, a CPAP machine is the most common um, uh, 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 um, <laughs> most common, I would call it appliance, but <laughs> most common thing that someone uses for, uh, for treating their sleep apnea. But, you know, there's oral appliances that are out there. There are implants that people are getting now to, for their apnea. There's positional devices. Should you speak to your doctor about any and all of those that you're using, um, you know, before, before you head into surgery? Yes. And the common practice, the standard of care practice, if the implant is attached to the palate, for example, a, a, a maxillary distractor, that's left in. If it's a, uh, an implant patient wears a night to sleep that they put in and they remove it in the morning, we don't have those in during surgery because as we'll talk later during the anesthetic, we're inside the patient's mouth to place airway tubes and, and uh, we don't want a dental appliance in there unless it's a fixed appliance. CPAP units, we ask each patient to bring it with them, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's let's transition. Um, that's a good transition point over to what's happening actually in uh, the surgery intra-op. Um, let's maybe talk a little bit now as we all, you know, we're all still deal dealing with COVID, you know, and you and your other colleagues um, in the hospital setting with surgeries, you know, even more so there's been the whole discussion about uh, CPAP machines being, you know, used in hospital settings, um, you know, with the aeration of the, of the virus. What is happening now, uh, at least where you're working with, uh, with that situation? The, the standard of care 
at Stanford right now is to have each patient have the uh, posterior nasopharynx COVID test done prior to surgery. And that's done within three days before surgery, but if it's a nasal or oral pharynx procedure, like many sleep apnea surgeries are, it has to be done within 24 hours. The CPAP units are brought in by the patients from home. They uh, would be topically disinfected with, with uh, by wiping them down. And that's all that will be done there. Okay. 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 So, um, well, that's, you know, continue. That's basically what we've been telling all of everyone in our community that if in the event you are going to the hospital for whatever reason, take your CPAP machine with you. Things will be determined when you're there. It's best to have your, you know, your machine and your equipment there with you. Don't just assume they're not going to let you use it or something like that because, um, you know, it is a life-saving device if, you know, if you have sleep apnea. So take it with you and work with the professionals there. So I'm glad that we can continue on with that same message. Um, so let's talk about specifically OSA patients and um, anesthesia and maybe the medicines that are giving. Are there certain risks that are a little bit different for those that have OSA? They are. Uh, in many ways, obstructive sleep apnea patients are at greater risk when they come to the operating room. It's a spectrum. The patients who have severe obstructive sleep apnea particularly if they're morbidly obese, are some of the most dangerous and most challenging patients that an anesthesiologist could take care of. Those should only be done in a hospital setting, and they should be done by anesthesiologists who are experienced in anesthetizing and managing the airway of an obstructive sleep apnea patient. Important thing to tell your listeners, all acute medical care follows the order of ABC, which is, stands for airway, breathing, and circulation. And the airway management of an obstructive sleep apnea patient can be very challenging, particularly, as I said, if they're morbidly obese, if they're heavy, if they have severe sleep apnea. If the anesthesiologist loses control of the airway and can't keep oxygen flowing through the upper airway, the patient gets hypoxemic, meaning they start to turn blue. A very dire situation, and five minutes of a patient turning blue damage. So we have our antenna up and all of those uh, warmed up when we're taking care of particularly heavy set patients with severe sleep apnea. Yeah. It's okay. a, as I said earlier, it's a spectrum. Some patients may have um, a, a, a mild sleep apnea based on their sleep test. And if they're having surgery in their ankle, if they're having surgery in their knee, and they're not morbidly obese, their risk is not as great. Uh, the important intervention the anesthesiologists make is what sort of airway tube we need to use and can we get the tube in. As I said earlier, all acute medical care and anesthesia care is airway breathing circulation. Right, right. So let's talk for a minute, because um, uh, we had a brief discussion on this beforehand about, um, you know, you're talking about surgeries on, on other body areas, and then what, surgeries that are specifically for sleep apnea. And so those are, you know, two different things that you're dealing with, um, you know, when a patient comes into your operating room. Correct. So let's start with the mild uh, procedures early on, first on. At, at our outpatient surgery center, where we do about 100 cases a week. There are a lot of endoscopy patients done. Some of them are having colonoscopies or upper GI endoscopies, which are common procedures. But if the patient has sleep apnea, it makes that common procedure have some risk to it. We have a cutoff at our centers. We try never to anesthetize a patient for a colonoscopy if their BMI is over 45. And uh, nobody for an upper GI if their BMI is over 40. Now, both 40 and 45 are in the range of morbid obesity. But what I'm trying to convey is that heavy set patients with sleep apnea, even for a minor procedure like a colonoscopy where there's no surgery, uh, can be life threatening. On the other end of the spectrum, if the patient is in the hospital and they're having a procedure on their that uh, on their airway, for example, to remedy sleep apnea, they're going to have what's called an endotracheal tube, which means those patients get a drug into the IV, usually propofol, it makes them fall asleep, and then they're paralyzed by another drug, could be succinylcholine or rocuronium. These are just muscle relaxant paralyzing drugs that we use. And then the anesthesiologist uses a lighted instrument called a laryngoscope, a laryngoscope, to place a breathing tube into the windpipe. 
And um, those you don't need for more minor surgeries, but you do need in a hospital setting. So it depends. It depends on two things, how serious the procedure is and how serious the sleep apnea is. You know, often when people talk about um, having surgery or um, when they're describing, you know, things to family members or whatever, you know, it's like anesthesia is like sleeping, right? Like you're sleeping, but you're not really sleeping, right? It's totally different. Or am I? Correct. It's it's not really the right simile to use. Uh, we use we use the verb sleep too because we don't have a better better to tell them where they're going into a temporary coma doesn't make anybody feel very very relaxed. But to answer your question there, the, the drugs that we use are the same for patients that have sleep apnea or the patients who do not have sleep apnea, but we're more careful with the sleep apnea patients. You have to give them yeah. in uh, divided doses, meaning you can, once you give an intravenous drug as an anesthesiologist, you can't take it back. So you give some, see how the patient reacts, give some more, see how the patient reacts. And the doses that we use are based on a patient's weight, and a patient's age, but there's also some judgment involved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about after surgery. So, um, you know, you have been describing how um, before you're heading into surgery and while in, in surgery, you're monitoring sleep apnea patients a little bit differently, keeping a little bit more of a keen eye, talking to them a little bit more up front in the preoperative. How about after the surgery when they're in recovery, what, be it at a uh, outpatient surgery center or in a hospital setting? So the transition from the operating room to the recovery room is supervised by the anesthesiologist entirely. If there's a breathing tube involved, like a more major procedure such as uh, uh, airway surgery, tonsillectomy, a palatal pharyngoplasty, if there's an airway tube involved, our job is to take the breathing tube out and make sure the patient's breathing safely. And that's all done in the operating room. My standard with patients who have sleep apnea is I don't remove the breathing tubes until their eyes are open, they're waking up to follow commands, and they're breathing spontaneously at a safe level. Then I'll take the breathing tube out, place a mask over their face, and with all my monitors there in the operating room, meaning we have a pulse oximeter, we have a blood pressure cuff, we have an electrocardiogram, we have monitors of the gases that go in and out of the patient, making sure that they are safely breathing on their own. We don't use CPAP units in the operating room. I am a two-legged CPAP unit. What anesthesiologists do is, if need be, we put the mask over the patient's face and we supply some positive pressure, airway pressure if necessary. But before an anesthesiologist, a prudent anesthesiologist, leaves the operating room, they're going to make sure that that patient is breathing safely. Once the pre patient is breathing safely, we trans transport the patient from the operating room table to a gurney, which is a bed with wheels on it. There's an oxygen tank on the gurney, and oxygen is supplied to the patient while they're on the gurney, either cannula going into their nose or a mask over their face. Or if it's severe, I might be holding the mask and giving them CPAP support as we roll down the hallway to the recovery room. Once we arrive at the recovery room, which begins the post-operative care, the anesthesiologist is still in charge. And our job is to, once again, make sure the airway breathing and circulation are safe. We turn the patient over to the nurse who's going to be taking care of the patient directly in the recovery room, explain the surgery, explain the anesthetic, which drugs were given, how many milligrams of each drug, what the timing was, the most recent drug, mm -hmm. and what the airway management is like. I won't walk away from that patient in the recovery room until I know that they're talking to me and that their breathing is safe without any support. I don't leave patients who still have an airway in, a breathing tube in, or obtunded, which is the medical word for meaning they're still snoring and they're not arousable. Okay. Uh, and typically, a patient who converse with you is safe. Yeah. Okay. So in that in that recovery setting, like uh, uh, you know, after um, you know the breathing tube has been removed and you've kind of they're they're uh, 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 coherent enough and, and and so forth that you can leave them. Um, you're still often very groggy and tired, and you know most most recent surgery patients just kind of drift off into into a sleep. At that point, um, I assume depending on what type of surgery you have, you could have your CPAP machine on, you know, while you're while you're sleeping. Then, is that the case? Yes. So I'll take this opportunity to tell you that in the 1980s, the surgeons that I worked with at Stanford, the sleep apnea surgeons, there were two very prominent 
surgeons named Nelson Powell and Bob Riley, and they invented a lot of the procedures that are currently used around the world to treat sleep apnea, particularly the maxillary mandibular osteotomy, which mm -hmm. rearranges the shape of the face and moves the tongue forward. The rule was ever since 1980s when we started doing the patient, they had the CPAP unit with them everywhere they went. And at times in the recovery room, you would apply the sleep, uh, the, the uh, CPAP unit over the patient when they're awake, and that would be appropriate. And at times when we would take them directly to the intensive care unit, as we would for the maxillary mandibular patients, they bypassed the recovery room and went directly to the ICU. They may strap on the CPAP unit there and it, it's helpful. But yeah. CPAP units, I've seen them over my 30 plus year career really only being used on severe patients, and particularly if they had some airway surgery done. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for a moderate patient, they're not going to be using their CPAP machine. Um, are there other ways that you're, you know, monitoring their, their progress through recovery, their breathing? So the, the monitoring the recovery room for sleep apnea patient is, isn't really any different than it would be for any of us. It includes the standard monitors, which would be a pulse oximeter, blood pressure cuff, electrocardiogram monitor, and tidal carbon dioxide monitor going in and out, some oxygen to breathe, and most importantly, a human monitor, which is a registered nurse who's right there. The, the, um, the difference is what happens when... Um, they leave the recovery room, and, and, and that's really where the decisions have to be made. For example, you said your husband was kept in the hospital overnight so he could be observed. So the decision when they're street safe, when is it okay for them to go out and be, be um, not observed by a nurse and all those monitors? And some of that comes with the tapering off of the drugs, and some of it comes with judgment. But um, a lot of it has to do with what kind of surgery was done and whether they're ready or not. The most, one of the most important uses of the sleep apnea machine, excuse me, the CPAP machine, is when they go to sleep that night, as they would take any at home at night. If they're staying in the hospital, they want to be sleeping with their, C, their CPAP in, in the hospital. If, okay. if it's a more trivial surgery and they're going home, they want to be having the CPAP unit. So more than wearing it in the recovery room, the most common thing is getting it back on at nighttime. Yeah. And I think that's interesting to point out because, you know, when I mean, me personally, you know, when I'm thinking of recovery, it's like, okay, I'm out of surgery, but there's actually, and, and whatever has happened after that, but there's actually a, an intense recovery period that you're describing, you know, where there's a lot of monitoring and then there's a decision made, you know, does it move into something a little more, uh, uh, something different? Um, a, just a hospital stay, an overnight stay, something along those lines. And that that's something different than specifically recovery. So that that's good to know because I kind of put lump ball that together, you know, right after the surgery, at least for me, you know, so I think that's good for our, you know, our community to understand there's a little bit of a difference there. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so is there anything else that you think that we should make sure that our community is aware of in regards to, you know, upcoming surgeries, be it, you know, for, for, you know, other ailments that they're having, um, you know, uh, whether it is for their OSA, um, you know, or, or, making some plans, you know, sometimes people, you know, kind of schedule certain things like knee surgeries and shoulder surgeries at a certain time because they know that the recovery and the rehabilitation is very long. Maybe get the sleep study before you go in and do all of that if, <laughs> if there's some time. The, the decision whether or not to have a sleep study will likely not be a decision that your patient will get to make, mm -hmm. but at least I think it's appropriate to ask the attending physicians whether it's appropriate. It gives the anesthesiologist some important information if the um, AHI, the apnea hypopnea index is 30 or greater, we have to be very, very careful, particularly in the post-operative management. Yeah. I think a message I want your, your listeners to realize is that while the anesthesiologist is present, you're usually pretty safe. When you have an anesthesiologist watching every breath and every heartbeat, you're pretty safe. But when we are gone, when we walk away, we're going to treat the situation differently if the AHI is 35 or if it's 10. Someone who's 35, um, we are being very careful to make very conservative management decisions. 
That's good information. That's good information to know. I also, I had read something that you wrote that, um, you know, an anesthesiologist's job in the operating room is to basically take care of the whole individual there so the surgeon can concentrate on that area of the body that they're dealing with. So I think that's also, you know, just as you said, uh, an important aspect to think about. You know, you're monitoring heart and breathing and, and blood pressure and all of those things so the other physician uh, can concentrate on your knee. Correct. Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Novak, for talking with us today in our community. I found your information very useful. Um, this is the first time that we've ever really talked about sleep apnea and preparing for, for surgery and, um, and, and, and some of the risks and some of the things that you should think about and make sure you talk about with your medical team. So I'm really happy that you joined us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for and inviting I me. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And everybody join us uh, next week. We'll be back the same time, Tuesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleephappia.org slash donate for details. SAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.